anything I can do to help you guys uh, get this out, I will do. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 21 best documentaries of each year. I feel a little sick to my stomach. I never heard him mention those things. Could we turn this off for a second? Uh. For this list, we'll be looking at our favorite documentary film released from each year from 2000 to 2020. Did your favorite make the list? Let us know in the comments. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to check out the full song at the link below. Two thousand Sound and Fury. Released in two thousand, Sound and Fury explores a conflict that has long been present in the deaf community. We would love for Heather to get involved with both worlds: deaf people, hearing people, everything. But the point of this for us is that we're worried that the cochlear implant will change her identity. The film focuses on two families, both of whom have children with hearing loss, who are deciding whether to provide their children with cochlear implants. The filmmakers delve into issues of deaf identity and the conflicts that arise in families around such a complex and multifaceted dilemma. I think that the parent who forces an implant on his child is not considering that child's feelings. The body belongs to the child. When he grows up, his parents can ask him then if he wants an implant. It was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, and while it didn't win, in many ways, this film was ahead of its time, exploring issues that have become part of the dialogue in mainstream culture today. 2001 – Rivers and Tides While many of the documentaries on this list tackle major global issues or deal with eye-opening subject matter, this one stands out from the crowd. Rivers and Tides is the exploration of an artist, namely Andy Goldsworthy, who creates temporary artistic installations using natural materials like rocks, branches, leaves, mud, and ice. When I make a work, I often take it to the very edge of its collapse. And that's a very beautiful balance. Goldsworthy is from Scotland, but has brought his art to various locations around the world. The film is written and directed by Thomas Riedelsheimer and won the Best Documentary Award from the San Diego Film Critics Society. So all the cons are, are related in some way, and they have become markers to my journeys and places that I feel an attachment towards. 2002. Bowling for Columbine. Well, here's my first question. Do you think it's a little dangerous handing out guns in a bank? While Michael Moore has become an increasingly divisive figure in recent years, his 2002 film, Bowling for Columbine, released 13 years after his wave-making debut, Roger and Me, essentially made him a household name, paving the way for a career that would include a number of other well-respected films. This one took a disturbing look at America's gun culture, skewering the nation's gun control attitudes and legislation in the wake of the Columbine school shooting in 1999. Moore's signature style combines dark humor with informative storytelling to great effect, making this film one of the most memorable of the decade. Uh, Mr. Hessen, just one more thing. This is who she is, or was. This is her. Mr. H please don't leave. Mr. Hessen, please, take a look at her. This is the girl. 2003, Capturing the Freedmans. I figure we'll, for lack of anything better to do, we'll take it towards a more serious side right about now. And we're going to conduct an interview with uh, Arnold Friedman, uh -huh. my father. The best documentary feature Oscar for films released in 2003 may have gone to the fog of war, but our pick for the best doc of the year has to go to Capturing the Freedmans. The film does a deep dive into the devastating charges against father and son, Arnold and Jesse Friedman. May not be here very much longer, but I'm still here. <laughs> That's the spirit. It frames the narrative with the family's own home movies, which put the entire case into disturbing context, while making viewers question the truth of what really happened. The documentary may not be able to provide audiences with definitive answers, but it still shines a bright light. 2004, Supersize Me. 
We didn't exactly need a documentary to teach us that eating exclusively fast food every day for a month was a bad idea. But Super Size Me showed us that it was worse than we could have imagined. I have to have everything on the menu at least once over the next 30 days, and I have to have three squares a day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Morgan Spurlock wrote, produced, directed, and starred in the film, in which he eats about 5,000 calories worth of fast food from McDonald's every day for 30 days and tracks his physical and mental results. Unsurprisingly, he basically felt terrible and gained a bunch of weight. My advice to you as a physician is that you've got to stop. You're pickling your liver. Yeah. You're, you know, you're kicking it while it's down now. You know, now it's down and you're, gonna, you're, you're kicking it further. Is it bad that we still kind of want a Big Mac? Rhetorical question. 2005, March of the Penguins. New nature documentaries are released every year, but very few of them have the impact that this one had. He will travel a great distance. And though he is a bird, he won't fly. Though he lives in the sea, he won't swim. Mostly, he will walk. But he won't walk alone. Luc Jacquet's March of the Penguins was co-produced by the National Geographic Society and shows in amazing and affecting detail the annual trek that emperor penguins take in Antarctica. While it is, of course, a movie about well, penguins, it manages to also be an emotional journey that shows the universal experience of struggle that anyone can relate to. The fathers now make an extra effort to weld their bodies together and resist the winter's rage. Enron, the smartest guys in the room, and Grizzly Man were also released in 2005 and should both go on your must-watch list. 2006, An Inconvenient Truth Famously created by former United States Vice President Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth is undoubtedly one of the most well-known documentaries of the century so far. This is what would happen to San Francisco Bay. A lot of people live in these areas. It's one of the most financially successful documentaries to ever be released in America, bringing in $24 million at the US box office. In fact, it can be said that public awareness about global warming and climate change was significantly impacted by this film's release. It's global warming. Global wapu? Yeah. Since it came out, it has been incorporated into school curriculums and even spawned a sequel, released in 2017, an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. 2007, The King of Kong. Many documentaries tackle serious and somber subject matter, so it's pretty rare to find one about something as seemingly innocuous as retro video games. Competitive gaming, when you want to attach your name to a world record, when you want your name written into history, you have to pay the price. But The King of Kong takes itself incredibly seriously, highlighting a major rivalry in the world of competitive gaming specifically between two men vying for the title of highest score in the 1981 arcade game Donkey Kong. And trying to beat this, this empire that I'm trying to break through and get a fair chance. It has heroes, villains, and a bunch of unforgettable side characters, and is a documentary that gamers and non-gamers alike will be sure to love. Don't miss Taxi to the Dark Side, also released in 2007. 2008, Man on Wire. In 1974, French tightrope artist Philippe Petit successfully spanned the distance between New York's Twin Towers, which were still under construction at the time, on a high wire. J'ai vu Philippe là, oui, c'était extraordinaire. C'était tellement, tellement beau. This documentary is based on Petit's own memoir of the events, and considering the fact that the stunt was illegal, the movie ends up feeling like a heist film, as we see Petit meticulously plan every aspect of the walk beforehand. I look at what uh, commercial vehicle go underneath for freight delivery. I go in, I, I find a way at lunchtime to disguise myself. The movie uses present day interviews, as well as reenactments of the major events of the story, with Paul McGill portraying Petit. 2009, The Cove. It will likely be difficult for any animal lover to watch this documentary, which was released in 2009 and exposes shockingly cruel fishing and dolphin hunting practices taking place in Japan. It's a relatively small group of people who are doing this. Outside these few remote villages, most of the population doesn't even know this is going on. The director behind the film is Luis Sahoyes who worked as a photographer for National Geographic before deciding to create The Cove. The film uses hidden camera footage to show the violence taking place in the fishing and whaling industry, an approach which was considered to be controversial. 
Regardless, The Cove received many accolades, including winning an Oscar in the documentary category. Let's go again with three cameras. You're two, you're one, and think about fourth. We would plant all the rocks, the hydrophones, underwater cameras. 2010, Inside Job. If you still feel like you don't quite understand what went down during the 2008 financial crisis, it might be time to watch Inside Job. This crisis was not an accident. It was caused by an out-of-control industry. Producer and director Charles Ferguson describes the film as being about, quote, the systemic corruption of the United States by the financial services industry and the consequences of that systemic corruption. If even that is too confusing, don't worry. The movie acts as a primer to understand some of the complex issues at play here, providing context for how the crisis took place. And many of them were given a triple A rating, which is the highest possible investment grade. This made CDOs popular with retirement funds, which could only purchase highly rated securities. Like many of the other films on our list today, this one won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. 2011, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. David Gelb is partly behind the popular Netflix cooking show Chef's Table. But before that, he created the renowned 2011 documentary Jiro Dreams of Sushi. The film takes viewers into the life of Jiro Ono, the owner and chef of what is considered to be one of the world's best sushi restaurants. <laughs> Suki Yabashi Jiro has just 10 seats and is located inside a Tokyo subway station, but it has plenty of clout. With the 20 course tasting menu coming in at 30,000 yen, or about $270. Ono's precise techniques are mesmerizing, and you'll inevitably be calling in an order to your favorite sushi spot after this film ends. 2012, The Act of Killing. Kita coba buat melalui layar lebar, buat apakah sepertinya uh, layar kecil lah, apa sebagainya lah begitu, tapi kita harus tunjukkan. It's tough to pick the best documentary of 2012, a year that saw the release of Stories We Tell and Searching for Sugar Man. But there was one film released that year that was like nothing we had ever seen before. The Act of Killing was helmed by Joshua Oppenheimer and focuses on the horrific events in Indonesia in the mid-1960s. In this film, some of the men involved in these crimes recreate their actions for the camera, using genres of American film to represent the real-life events. It's an unsettling experiment with very troubling results, but this film will likely go down in history as one of the most memorable documentaries of all time. 2013. Blackfish. It's becoming clear that dolphins and whales have a sense of self, a sense of social bonding that they've taken to another level. 20 Feet from Stardom, released in 2013, takes an interesting behind the scenes look at the careers of background singers for famous musical acts. But there was one documentary that everyone was talking about in 2013 Blackfish. Sure, we all knew that there was some sketchy stuff going on at SeaWorld before this movie came out, but the doc just proved that it was, again, all so much worse than we could have imagined. Just like kidnapping a little kid away from her mother. Everybody's watching, what can they do? Focusing on a specific orca, Tilikum, who was involved in three employee deaths, the film takes a micro issue and shines a light on the inhumane practices that led to these events. 2014, Citizen Four. Ex-NSA contractor Edward Snowden became famous as a whistleblower for leaking secret documents about global surveillance by the National Security Agency in 2013. The documentary Citizen Four features Snowden himself, along with journalist Glenn Greenwald. Why did you decide to do what you've done? So for me, it, it all comes down to state power against the people's ability to meaningfully oppose that power. The film gets its name from the moniker that Snowden used for himself when he initially emailed information about the illegal wiretapping practices to documentary filmmaker Laura Poitras. The documentary covers the events that followed his initial disclosure, including the international and personal fallout. Wow, that's really something. 2015, Amy. Everybody just wanted to spend time with Amy. 
In our business, there's nothing that can prepare you for that level of success. Amy Winehouse's life and career have fascinated the public for years. After her sudden, tragic death in 2011, there were still many questions left about who the star truly was behind the scenes. Director Asif Kapadia compiled footage from Winehouse's life, focusing on her battle with substance abuse. She couldn't escape her life in this horrible goldfish bowl. She began to unravel in public, and the media treatment pushed her further and further over the edge. It was produced in part by Universal Music, with the CEO of the UK branch of the company, David Joseph, saying, quote, It tackles a lot of things about family and media, fame, addiction, but most importantly, it captures the very heart of what she was about. It won a bunch of awards, including the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. 2016, OJ Made in America. Ava DuVernay's 2016 masterpiece, 13th, took an eye-opening look at the history of the United States' 13th Amendment and its consequences. Another film that was released in 2016 and tackled the treatment of African Americans was the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary, OJ Made in America. Arnold James Simpson had that shine. The sun hit him and there was this thing about him because he really was that great. Covering O.J. Simpson's rise to fame and his unforgettable downfall, this film provides context for why the infamous murder case went the way it did. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. I had a, a feeling of numbness. Did this really happen? The five-part film clocks in at nearly eight hours, but was compelling enough to keep viewers hooked all the way through. 2017, Icarus. 2017 marked the 20-year anniversary of Princess Diana's death, and the occasion was marked with the release of the heart-rending documentary, Diana in Her Own Words. The most widely recognized documentary of 2017, however, was Icarus, which took home, you guessed it, the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Icarus eventually takes a deep dive into the Russian state-sponsored doping scandal that upended the sports world at the Sochi Olympics in 2014. Because, you know, we are top-level cheaters. And to, to, to overcheat us, you should be much such experience, but how it comes such experience? The creator of the film, Brian Fogel, actually began the movie's journey by taking performance-enhancing drugs in an effort to show the effects of hidden doping in cycling. 2018, Won't You Be My Neighbor. Let's take a look at this one. While Free Solo and Three Identical Strangers, both released in 2018, were extremely compelling, they couldn't compete with the feel-good content of Won't You Be My Neighbor. This documentary examines the life of Fred Rogers, also known as Mr. Rogers, host of the iconic Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. Produced and directed by Morgan Neville, it quickly became the highest grossing biographical documentary ever made. Writing for New York Magazine, David Edelstein summed up most viewers' thoughts, calling the film, quote, a wonderful breather from reality, from which you come back more conscious of, and dismayed by, the hate that more than ever runs the world. A neighborhood was a place where, at times, that you felt worried, scared, unsafe, would take care of you, would provide understanding, safety, that's what the neighborhood was for Fred. 2019, fire. So now, you know, we hope everybody comes and enjoys the cultural experience of the decade, Fire Festival. 2019 was a major year for documentaries, with the release of hard hitters like Apollo 11 and American Factory. But there was a slightly more lighthearted documentary that captured the public's attention and fascination like no other. Fire, released by Netflix, covers the events leading up to the absolute failure of Billy McFarlane's Fire Festival. Fire is kind of like a wreck, not only in that it's an utter disaster, but also in that you simply cannot look away. We didn't have enough staff, it was just, we were overwhelmed. The movie hit the streaming network just days after Hulu's own original doc, Fire Fraud, was released, with many binging both films as a double feature. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. 2020, Crip Camp. If you're looking for a truly inspiring documentary, look no further than 2020's Crip Camp. <laughs> Written, 
produced and directed by Nicole Noonan and James Lebrecht. The film also features Barack and Michelle Obama as executive producers. Crip Camp looks back on Lebrecht's own experiences at Camp Jeanette, a camp in New York State for teenagers with disabilities that existed from the 1950s to the 1970s. For me, the camp experience really was empowering because we helped empower each other that the status quo is not what it needed to be. Many of the campers went on to become disability advocates, which is the story that the film focuses on. This is a very powerful movie about kids, shared humanity, and the work for social progress. Do you agree with our picks? Let us know in the comments. And hey, if you're a fan of the song playing right now, be sure to check out the music video for it right here.